Uh, my name is George Cooper, and I'm the president of the University of King's College, which uh, welcomes you all very warmly uh, to the university this evening. King's, uh, King's cherishes the long-standing relationship uh, that we have had with uh, Roselle Green and the Green family, the Saul Green family and uh, collaterals, and with the Shar Shalom Synagogue. And so it's a great uh, pleasure for me tonight uh, to be here and to welcome you. King's um, aims to be uh, like a Greek philosopher's forum, forum uh, where the uh, principles and foundations uh, of knowledge are discussed and debated, and particularly so, where we can try and draw connections between the humanities and the sciences. And so, uh, I uh, uh, will stop talking now, and I will ask uh, Dr. Phil Belisky uh, to come forward and to introduce our guest speaker tonight, uh, John Murray. Phil is a professor of emeritus in the Department of Neurology uh, in the Faculty of Medicine uh, at Dalhousie University. And uh, <clears throat> Phil and I and Roz and Tia have become friends because uh, we had children, each of us, uh, living in Singapore. And we've traveled there together on at least one occasion. And uh, in my mind, I don't know if it's ever actually happened, but in my mind, I see Phil and I uh, sipping a Singapore sling <laughs> in the long bar at uh, Raffles Hotel in Singapore, which in my own case, uh, after doing so, uh, means that I really do require uh, a, a, a urology consultant to attend. <laughs> uh, Phil. Um, George, you should know that I'm now retired. But I can refer you to some very capable people who can help you with me. Um, good evening, and on behalf of Shasha Mong Synagogue um, and the Green family, I'd like to welcome you all. Um, I've known Jock Murray for, I guess, around 40 years. It turns out that there is only a two-week difference in our ages, but you'd never know it. He looks younger, he's better looking, he dresses better than I do. As a matter of fact, when he was dean of the medical school, he introduced his signature shirt, which was a white collar and blue or pink or other color um, uh, body of the shirt. And within six months, that became the standard uniform amongst the, his employees in the dean's office. Um, and you know, they all looked good. Um, it really is a pleasure for me to introduce Jock Murray to you. There are a number of things, so many things, that Jock has done in his career. Um, and there are some things that I believe he would be particularly proud of and would not feel embarrassed by me mentioning them to you. And these are the important roles that he has played in teaching, in providing directly and through his enrollment of others to healthcare to an important part of our population. His role in developing and expanding the humanities as an integral part of the curriculum of the medical school. And also his seminal role in making the history of medicine such an important topic within the medical school and amongst the medical community in, um, uh, in general, and which leads to him being here tonight. My first encounter with Jock as a teacher was not being one of his pupils, 
But shortly after my arrival in Halifax, when I would be making rounds, he always had more students around him than I did. And it was for good reason. As you'll see tonight, his style is anything but didactic, and he's very creative and imaginative, and has played such an important role in changing the way in medicine, in which medicine is taught to undergraduates. And this was not only as a teacher personally, for which he has won many awards, including Professor of the Year, including Mentor of the Year from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, but also in his role as Dean. And another personal recollection that I have of Jock as Dean was the very elegant way in which he made a little reception for myself and a colleague who both on that occasion were promoted to the rank of full professor. And just the elegant way in which he did it, the fact that we had some booze in his office to celebrate, I thought this is a really great deal. Um, but, but his legacy certainly remains to now. Um, his role in, the, in creating the Department of Humanities um, has, been, um, uh, has been stellar. And one of the most remarkable events in the medical school is the display on an annual basis of the art, poetry, and art in all of its forms that the medical students are encouraged to, uh, uh, to create. His role in the history of medicine as the founder of the History of Medicine Society in, um, at Dalhousie, and then even further, uh, extending beyond at the national and international levels also makes him renowned. Um, and in the field of neurology, which is, was his primary clinical specialty, his focus was on multiple sclerosis. And his, his work in multiple sclerosis went far beyond the individual direct care of patients at which he was a master but in putting together teams to create a holistic approach to that dreadful disease. And how this has spread internationally as a form of addressing the problem of multiple sclerosis in patients. Jock has published well over 200 um, articles, book chapters, books, um, and is renowned as an author. His, uh, he has had lifetime achievement awards from virtually every organization he ever belonged to. Um, he has the uh, honor and privilege of having both an Order of Canada and an Order of Nova Scotia, um, Queen's Jubilee Medal, and honorary degrees from St. Francis Xavier and Acadia, and I'm sure the list is growing. So it's important that you hear him, not me, so I'm going to stop um, and um, uh, look forward uh, to hearing uh, his discussion of um, uh, differences in, um, in, in medical practices defined by the ethics of some of the most famous philosophers in medical history. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Phil. Phil and I have been colleagues, as he said, for a very long time. This is a great honor for me for a number of reasons. One is, when I was a dean of medicine, our hope was always to graduate physicians who would be outstanding in their care of patients and in the community. And Dr. Green was one of those, and I knew him for many, many years, and Roselle and I are old friends, so to be asked to give this lecture on behalf of the memory of Saul Green is a great, great honor for me. It interested me for many years why codes of ethics, which would determine how physicians would act, what virtues, what duties and responsibilities they must carry out, kept being defined over and over. 
And the question is, why, when there were attempts to do this, did they seem to always differ? And so I'm going to look at a number of these and see a number of aspects about codes that have been with us for thousands of years. Now this is a cartoon. Primum non nocere, if you like, as Latin scholars, the hard C, is probably Hippocrates' most famous line. We'll come to it again later, because Hippocrates probably never said it. But the question that they ask in the cartoon is, first, do no harm. Do we really need a rule for that? Well, codes of ethics are laid down because people repeatedly say, yes, you do need a rule for that. In fact, you need a rule for a number of things to determine how physicians should act. This week, in the newspapers, you will see a number of stories, and this is just a few, about the end-of-life care issue that is uh, developing over a patient in British Columbia. A pregnant, brain-dead woman who's being kept on life support, and there's a lot of discussion between the health authorities, the physicians, and the family about how people should be acting in that case. Our friendly, supportive IT staff here today will be interested that there is a call to have a code of ethics for information technologists similar to the doctors. There's a discussion and a conflict over whether the Hippocratic Oath is still applicable when health organizations that operate as businesses want other rules to be laid down. There's a physician accused of a sexual relationship with a patient. There are three stories that question the, this issue of caring for an individual versus a broader concept of population health or duties to the healthcare system. And so all of these have issues addressing the code of ethics of physicians. Now I think it's an interesting question to put to you about what you think you should have or would like to see in a code of ethics for your doctor. Because I think most of you could, with a pencil and paper, write a number of things that you think are very important in the way your doctor should act towards you and the values uh, that that physician should have. And in fact, increasingly, patients are involved in determining codes of ethics. It's always been recognized that any profession should have a recognized, accepted code of ethics. These codes have two aspects. One are the non-moral rules, and in those, there are things repeatedly about how physicians, for instance, should uh, act towards each other. And there are moral values about the, the issues that they have for their duties and responsibilities. Now, I'm going to look at who writes codes, what is their influence, why is there no universally accepted code of ethics for physicians, and why do they continually change? Lots of people write the codes. Initially, it tended to be individuals. Individual physicians would list or write in their writings what they thought the value should be, and others often then accepted those. Religious groups over the centuries have also begun to define what they believe physicians should act, usually incorporating their religious beliefs. Medical associations, particularly in the mid 19th century, began to list their code of ethics for their members. More recently, hospital associations have codes of ethics. Healthcare corporations acting as businesses still have what they think a code of ethics should be for physicians. Governments have written them. Communist Russia has a code of ethics, and we'll talk a little about that. And now patient groups are defining them, particularly in terms of patient rights within the discussion. They've taken many forms. Over the century, there have been many prayers. And these were prayers in which the physician would have a prayer 
which had all of the values and responsibilities and duties within them. They had oaths. And the famous Hippocratic Oath, for instance, taken by medical schools, including here at Dalhousie, asking the new graduate to accept and take an oath that they will follow these values. There are many texts that incorporate within the text the values, and we'll talk about a few of those. And there are codes, and these are codes that list the values. There are directives, so occasionally over an incident, a new directive will be added to the list. And there are laws that say this uh, is a way that a physician must act in certain circumstances. Now one of the earliest ones is actually in China. And the person who is called the China King of Medicine had two textbooks with very long lists of medicines, uh, but in the first chapter of each of the books, there was a code of ethics for physicians. And it is still required reading for Chinese physicians. And I have an excerpt because I think a couple of the things are interesting. One is a great physician should not pay any attention to status, wealth, or age. Neither should he question whether the particular person is attractive or unattractive, whether he is an enemy or a friend, whether he is Chinese or a foreigner, or finally, whether he is uneducated or educated. He should meet everyone on equal grounds. He should always act as if he were thinking of his close relatives. Now it's interesting because even though that's a, that's a very old code, some of those things are incorporated in modern code, and some of those have been changed in dramatic ways. Confucian codes of ethics, however, didn't like the idea of the great physician, that the physician was an elite. They thought everybody should be responsible for their own health, and the physician is just one to assist in that. But in the 10 maxims, there were the admonition that we should treat all equally, keep fees modest, treat the poor without char charge, but with the same care. Above all, no, no Confucian principles and, and concepts. The idea, again, of incorporating some religious beliefs within the physician's code. And they talked about the importance for the physician of compassion and humanness, or humaneness. Now those are words that don't reoccur until the 20th century in codes. The prayers are famous. There's an ancient Greek uh, prayer, Maimonides' prayer, and we'll return to the prayer of Maimonides because it's interesting. And during medieval ages, there were lots of physician prayers. Uh, prayers said by the physician uh, and repeated in medical schools and at uh, anywhere that, that medicine was carried out. There's an interesting one in India because it had a in incorporation of a, a code for medical students. He should live as an aesthetic, be a virtual slave to his preceptor place patient needs above his own, keep patients secrets, and abstain from drunkenness, crime, and adultery. He must avoid care to the ruler's enemies, to evildoers, to unattended women, and to those on the verge of death. Now that's interesting because what, you remember we heard before in the code, you treat everyone, no matter what. This code is saying, you don't treat the enemies of the ruler. You don't treat evildoers. You don't treat unattended women who are presumably <laughs> prostitutes. And you don't treat those on the verge of death. Now you will see, of course, that those things in codes to come will all be altered. An ancient Hebrew medical text, probably the oldest <coughs> medical text, it has a lot of aspects about the way to live your life, healthy rules for life, but it also has a number of ethical requirements of the physician. Heal the poor and the needy. Speak the truth. Avoid those who use charms, idols, and sorcery. And we'll see repeatedly in oaths that physician oaths try to exclude other groups or beliefs. No medicine for abortion. Do not provide poisons or others or even describe the herbs that work as poisons. 
And those two things recur for thousands of years. Do not use a cutting instrument or cautery in haste. Examine three times before giving advice. That's very interesting because other codes at the time indicated that you should not do surgery. And the reason was surgery was so dangerous. This one says it's dangerous, so you should examine the patient at least three times before you advise something that's so serious, which I think was wise for its age. The best known code, of course, is the code of Hippocrates. And it was for thousands of years uh, repeated in various forms. This is the tree of Kos, a plane tree on the island of Kos under which Hippocrates taught and it still grows there. I had some seeds from this tree that I tried to grow, but it didn't work. And someone I think once said that you should be aware of a, a physician whose plants don't grow. But, <laughs> And so mine didn't, unfortunately, but it's still there. And Hippocrates, and the concept of the school of Hippocrates became, of course, known for thousands of years. What isn't often known uh, or uh, regarded is the fact that we don't know that Hippocrates actually wrote any of this, because there was a school of Hippocrates, of the beliefs of Hippocrates, and these writings probably came from the school and the other authors and, and students of this era. And the first record we have of it is in the uh, library at Alexandria, and that's almost 600 years later. And since then, it continues to be changed and altered. So what people say is the Code of Hippocrates and the Oath of Hippocrates changes repeatedly. And it, I particularly referred to a premium non nocere, first do no harm. Uh, it's interesting because uh, yesterday I was in an elevator and someone there, the uh, security person in the elevator said, what are you going to be speaking about? And I was down at the CBC. And I said, it's about codes of ethics for physicians. And he said, oh, first do no harm. And he said, don't tell them anything else. That's the only thing that's important. It's interesting because that is so well known, and you can't find it anywhere in the writings of Hippocrates. And it probably doesn't matter because it's the concept, it's the idea. It's almost as if, well, if Hippocrates didn't say it, he should have. And because it does capture, and you can find the idea in Hippocrates, just not the exact words. There are two parts to the oath. The first is a contractual agreement between students and their teachers. And the second is the code. And the oath is sworn on Apollo the physician, Aesculapius, Hygieia, and Panacea, and all the other gods and goddesses. The student will be adopted member of the teacher's family, but will support him and his children in times of need, and instruct his children free. Uh, my students don't buy that one, so my daughter Shannon, who's here, is not going to benefit from the fact that my medical students will take care of you for the rest of your life. <laughs> Knowledge not shared with those who haven't taken the oath, and that's a very interesting one because that recurs in many codes. Don't share the medical knowledge, particularly about poisons and medicines, because people will abuse it. In fact, that gets reversed in the 20th century when codes say it is the responsibility to share medical information with the public. Under the ethics, the major items are treat patients to the best of your ability. No poisons or abortive remedies. No cutting of the stone. And that became accepted as no surgery. It's just dangerous surgery and leave surgery to the person who is skilled at doing it. No sex with those in the houses you enter, and no disclosure of patient information. And that will then recur for thousands of years about the sharing of patient information. As far as we know, for the first 400 years or so, there wasn't much influence from the code or the oath of Hippocrates until Galen began to write about it. And Galen became the next great authority in medicine. 
first Hippocrates, then Galen. And after that, great interest in this idea of a code of ethics, adopting the concepts that were in Hippocrates. At the rise of the Christian era, the Christians wanted their ideas to shape the code, and particularly the idea that illness uh, came from God as either uh, for your evil doing or some other aspect, but healing would then be by prayer, not by physicians. And they altered codes to reflect that belief. And the codes that have been used since then have been variations, mostly on 10th century copies of, of Hippocrates, which had been rewritten. But the real rise of the Hippocratic Oath uh, began in the 19th century, particularly in the United States, when they were attempting to improve the status and the quality of medical education and wanted to improve their relationship with the general public who had some disdain for medicine at the time. And so they all began to use the, the oath. British schools at the time, and we'll return to this, didn't tend to use it very much. As time went on, they began to re re rewrite the code of Hippocrates as a Christian code, and then in more recent times, a completely secular code, removing all of the uh, discussions about calling on Apollo or calling on God, uh, they indicated that they would just swear to these things. And I'll show you the one used at Dalhousie. So not only are they revised, almost every medical school that now uses the Hippocratic Oath tends to revise their own. So each medical school has a slightly different one. And at Dalhousie, um, this is the one used. The medical students each year look at the code to decide if that is acceptable and that they would swear to these aspects. So even now, it gets changed uh, subtly. And it became very secular about 20 years ago. But the ideas, now whether Hippocrates actually wrote it or whether it got buried is not the issue. It's the concepts, it's the idea that's encapsulated in this that's important. So this is the one that, at Dalhousie that is used each year. Now the next major code was that of Maimonides. And this is the image, all images of Maimonides come from this uh, particular image that was in a, uh, a book in the uh, 18th century. He was not only a physician, he was a great philosopher and a great rabbi. And Sir William Osler referred to him as the prince of Jewish physicians. He was born in Cordoba, Spain, 1138. Mother died in childbirth. Uh, the family had to periodically flee because of persecution. There are interesting stories about what happened because he appears to have disappeared for two years. And, but when returned, was noticed to have great knowledge about many areas, and people don't know whether he went off to study or there's some other uh, story. Uh, but he became recognized widely, uh, including in other cultures, as the great and wise physician of the time. So consulted by world leaders at the time, sultans, uh, Muslim leaders, and others, wrote 10 major books on medicine. And even though the titles may look a little odd, they are more general than they sound. Uh, the treatise on asthma is about, about the environment and climates and diets and clean air. The one on hemorrhoids is actually about the gastrointestinal system. One of the sultans, trying to keep up with the uh, demands of his many concubines, asked him for advice on sexuality, and he wrote a great treatise uh, on that. And so these became very important, particularly the Glossary of Drug Names, which is a major text uh, at the time with over 2,000 uh, medicines. He had many ideas that were different than the, the physicians of centuries before that. He really believed that your quality of your life 
and how you dealt with your life and healthy practices was the way to a healthy life, not selecting a care by physicians. And he showed the link between the moral and physical purity as being both a religious concept as well as a medical one. And I thought this was a particularly interesting quotation from the glossary of drug names in which he defined something that people at the time were struggling with, and that's that the difficult uh, separation, they thought, between uh, the concepts of medicine and religion. He said, religion prescribes all that is useful and forbids all that is harmful in the next world, while the doctor indicates what is useful and warns against what is harmful in this world, which is, I think, a nice uh, separation of the two roles. And there are a lot of uh, aphorisms that are very interesting to read, but the most interesting aspect is that he challenged the authorities. All physicians at the time got their knowledge from authorities. All of the writers before were the authority for your knowledge. What he is saying is, learn from what you're doing. Learn new things, ask new questions, advance. So don't, don't just accept the authority. Uh, learn to, to advance your thought by examining what you are seeing, which is a scientific concept that doesn't occur until Descartes and others some centuries later. And he said, even though others respected Galen as the great authority, Galen considers himself more perfect than he really is. He also stressed, and this was not stressed in any other writings at the time, that the emotional life of the patient uh, was important and how this would affect the illness. Some of the pages from Maimonides. But the thing that was important uh, for later centuries was the Maimonides Oath. The eternal providence has appointed me to watch over the life and health of thy creatures. May the love for thy art or my art actuate me at all times. May neither avarice nor miserliness nor thirst for glory or for a great reputation engage my mind. For the enemies of truth and philanthropy could easily deceive me and make me forgetful of my lofty aim of doing good to thy children. May I never see in the patient anything but a fellow creature in pain. And the important aspect I mentioned about questioning authority, he said, give me the strength, time, and opportunity always to correct what I have acquired, always to extend its domain. For knowledge is immense, and the spirit of man can extend indefinitely to enrich itself daily with new requirements. Today he can discover his errors of yesterday and tomorrow and he can obtain a new life on what he thinks himself sure of today. So don't just accept authority. Begin to examine and gain new knowledge. O oh God, thou hast appointed me to watch over life and death of thy creatures. Here am I ready for my vocation, and now I turn to my calling. It's a wonderful oath for medical students and is still used in many medical schools today. Now, another interesting and very popular one was the prayer of Maimonides. This was a physician prayer. But its origins became of great uh, controversy. Uh, it was a, first noticed in a periodical in 1783, which was inserted by Dr. Marcus Hertz as the prayer of Maimonides. Um, but the belief has been that it was probably Hertz who wrote it. But again, it's almost as if, well, it, it, but it has all of the concepts and the beliefs of Maimonides. So uh, it's probably just as well that we accept the idea. So William Osler, the great Canadian physician, asked the chief rabbi of the British Empire, Dr. Joseph Hertz, about the authorship. And he said that it probably was Dr. Hertz of Berlin. But I'm not sure it's that important, just it's not important that we now use a code of Hippocrates that wasn't written by Hippocrates. That's a picture of Hertz at the time, who was a great philosopher, 
as well as a physician. And this is a statue of Maimonides, and the front page of his great work on philosophy, The Guide for the Perplexed. And that's Maimonides' tomb. Now, Shannon and I, some years ago, did a paper together on the doctor of physic in the Canterbury Tales. One of the pilgrims on, in Canterbury Tales by Chaucer was a doctor, and it was a doctor of physic. And Chaucer not only describes him very well, he's the best described pilgrim. And what he says about the doctor of physic is that he's very well read. He knows all of the great authorities of medicine. He lists all the books that he knows. And he knows about astronomy, and he knows about healing, he knows about medicines. But it indicates he's not very ethical. And he doesn't read much of the Bible. And he splits these with the apothecaries. And he makes different medicines for the rich and for the poor. And he makes a great deal of money by the scared population during the plagues. And he goes on to indicate that what really this physician is in need of is a code of ethics. And he ends the discussion of the doctor of physic with a line that I think is worthy of some thought. He says, and the doctor, after all, loves gold too much. So he was in need of a code of ethics because in in fact, in Britain at the time, physicians were beginning to be recognized as learned. They knew the books. They had science now. And they were differentiating themselves from barber surgeons and tooth pullers and bone setters and midwives and others by the fact that they had this science. Uh, but they still didn't have one code of ethics that they ascribed to. And this shows the doctor at the time holding up the flask of urine. They usually made this a doctor, uh, I'm sure that Phil would be delighted. They were known as piss prophets because they could make a diagnosis by examining the urine. And Dr. Belitsky is one of the modern piss prophets. So. <laughs> but they different, you notice he has a big book in front of him. That differentiated him from people who just had a skill. Um, and the barber surgeons at the time and they wanted to separate themselves and be recognized. And so a code of ethics that said we ascribe to these things would then separate them from people who were going about the countryside just with an individual skill. But the first code of ethics that occurred by the Royal College of Physicians is essentially just a code of ethics for their meetings. It said physicians should be on their best behavior at meetings. They should have regular attendance. Don't um, criticize or accuse your colleagues in public, and don't reveal medicines, lest the people be harmed by the abuse of them. That, you notice, occurred in earlier codes. So it really didn't have any of the values or duties and responsibilities, just on how physicians acted towards each other. When that changed was Thomas Percival in Manchester, was asked to address a problem in the Manchester Hospital of colleagues who were not behaving very well towards each other. And so what he did was spend some time, and from that developed what he called um, medical jurisprudence, a large book of essentially ethical behaviors for physicians. He was very wise in sending this out to scholars, to legal authorities to other physicians at the time and got responses back. And one of the responses said, I don't like your title. I think you should call it medical ethics. And that's where we get the term. And it came, and his book was then called Medical Ethics. And it had a number of items in it. Respect your colleagues, treat patients with tenderness, steadiness, condescension, and authority. Now, condescension meant something entirely different at that time. It meant treat them on the same level that your equals, not our modern use of the word. Accept surgery as a useful practice. Because surgery, as you know, in the earlier codes was warned against. Respect the ranks of different physicians, because in England at the time, 
physicians did hold different levels of, um, of respect. Do not steal patients, don't criticize your colleagues, and conduct yourself to enhance the respect of the profession. Well, as a code of ethics, it's a little limited, but at the time, it became very influential. And it was more about the timing of this. Because in the United States, medicine was in a terrible state, and they wanted to improve the status of medicine, medical education, and they began to look to Percival's work, and also uh, often the work of Gregory in Edinburgh, to give principles and virtues that they wanted the physicians to, to ascribe to. The British at the time said, now we have, we have well-developed licensing, so we don't need really a code of ethics. But the Americans really liked the idea. And although there are later books on medical ethics, it was only after World War II that there really was an official code of ethics uh, seen in Britain. And one of the reasons that the British didn't think they needed one is they said, physicians in England are gentlemen. And gentlemen understand their code of ethics and how they behave. And so they thought uh, that they didn't require one. And so we have a British gentleman acting according to the way a gentleman would act. In France at the time, physicians were regarded as great intellects, very powerful, probably the most powerful minds in the post-revolutionary era because they had command over life and death and they had science and they had knowledge. So one of the interesting things about looking at something like early 19th century medicine, you have to say in which country, because it differed in different countries. And the one that was strikingly different was the United States, because at the time, medicine was totally unregulated. Americans don't like to regulate very much, and they didn't regulate doctors, and they didn't regulate medical schools, and they didn't even like regulating licensing. And so you had physicians uh, like these chaps who were graduated in schools often in six to 18 months. You could set up your own medical school. There were no requirements. There were no requirements to get into medical school. You just had to pay your fees. They usually all graduated after a year. Louisville, Kentucky had 50 medical schools. A doctor could set up a medical school in his house, take in six students, graduate them at the end of the year. Uh, there were no requirements, and, and so the state of medicine in the United States was quite different and highly uh, unregulated and not respected by anyone, including the public, because they couldn't tell the difference between the quacks and the physicians. And here's a famous cartoon of the era that shows the fellow churning at the top. He's turning this great <coughs> mill, and the chaps are running in, they're taking a course of chemistry for 250, a course in therapeutics, a 10 minute course, and he's churning these people out and they're pouring out on the public at the bottom, they're sawing off legs, they're doing all, and that was the concept of these uh, medical school mills uh, that were producing physicians of poor quality. But at the time, Major advances were being made. This is the ether dome in Boston when they first used anesthesia. They began to recognize there are important advances. Medicine has to become under control in the United States. And one of the ways they did it was with a code of ethics that physicians would ascribe to. Develop the kind of principles of what a good physician should be, which was captured in the famous painting of Sir Luke Files, called The Doctor. You know, at one time, this used to hang in every doctor's office, because it seemed to capture what people thought were the virtues and uh, the qualities of a good physician. And so the Americans really wanted one. And so in 1847, at the time they formed the American Medical Association, they developed a code of ethics. And they took it mostly from Percival, and some from Gregory. They restricted competition among physicians, but one of the things they wanted to do was to find themselves differently than what they decided were the quacks. 
and that could be any group that was uh, in a non-medical area, unlike the medical school. So it could be the homeopaths or uh, people who sold certain uh, medical cures. Uh, later on, uh, there were a number of, of Thompsonians, sects, other groups that they wanted to exclude. So the code of ethics was not just going to improve the, the status of the physician, it was going to be used as a tool to exclude other groups. And no consulting with non-licensed practitioners. Now, it keeps getting revised. And so the American Medical Association Code is repeatedly revised because of the changing values, both in medicine and society. And also, occasionally, the law says you can't do what you're doing. So it gets revised. Uh, one that's added later is the requirement that physicians report legal and ethical infractions. The confidentiality one got modified because it always said in codes of ethics, you must keep in confidence patient information. Then a law says, well, there are circumstances in which you must reveal patient information. If it's a danger to society, a danger to the person, a danger to other people, in those circumstances, you should reveal information. So it starts to get modified. The involvement of the patients and community groups in defining these got added in 1989. And then the concept of rights, which is a, you know, in the last uh, few decades has become an important discussion in society. The idea of rights begins to appear in codes of ethics. And one interesting one that Canadians tend to notice is a change in the code of ethics around advertising and entrepreneurship. Because in the code of ethics, it always said doctors can't advertise. And it said, and also, you can't use medicine to be an entrepreneur and great, make great money on the sick. But the Supreme Court said medicine is, is a, and the profession, is subject to antitrust legislation. And because it should be treated like a business, you can't prohibit advertising and you can't restrict trade. When that happened, you began to see, as you see on television, continually, the advertising of physicians and their treatments and uh, other aspects of medicine are now widely advertised in the United States. And the idea of restricting physicians from being entrepreneurs has disappeared. Now in Canada, about the same time as the Americans, the Canadian Medical Association was set up with Sir Charles Tupper as its first president and they developed a code of ethics. And it's been continually revised, and they now have a permanent committee on ethics at the CMA that, that repeatedly looks at the code of ethics to see if changes uh, should be made. And there are a number of other Canadian groups that have defined codes of ethics as well. Now, one of the most interesting and important codes was developed after World War II, and that was the Nuremberg Code. Because of the Nazi medical experiments, it was a trial of the Nazi doctors. And as a result of that, some of them were acquitted, others were sent to prison, and a number were hanged. Even the German physicians themselves knew that they were violating moral standards for research. But they made the argument that in Germany, everything they did was lawful. They then argued, we're not breaking the law if there's not a law. They also indicated that in the literature, there are all sorts of other experiments published by others that look much the same as we did. And they said um, that there was no impropriety in absence of a standard of propriety. The standard of propriety being a code of ethics. And because they didn't have one they ascribed to, 
they said there is no impropriety if you don't have a standard. The, the tribunal at the time, of course, did not accept it. And that's why they imprisoned some and hanged others. But the important thing that came from that was a code called the Nuremberg Code that now said you cannot carry out medical experiments on anyone without their consent. That later gets modified to say without their informed consent. So it's not just agreeing, they must know exactly what they're agreeing to. That probably became the most important change in ethical codes uh, in the last half century. Now one interesting thing, I got involved in a very heated argument in the United States some years ago over a discussion about some medical experiments that were carried out that were clearly outrageous. And the person who was discussing these experiments said, well, at the time, we didn't have any rules against this. Well, the reason they didn't is that they didn't sign the Nuremberg Code. It's interesting that the Americans were the ones who, in fact, were instrumental in, in formulating and drafting it. Leo Alexander of, of New York drafted the Nuremberg Code. The Americans believed it's for other people, it's for other countries, not for them. And so, like the World Court and other things, they didn't sign it. And so we got the Tuskegee experiments, and we got other cancer experiments that uh, went on after this because they did not ascribe to it. But that changed when the medical, World Medical Association developed both a code of ethics and a code of ethics about medical experimentation. The World Medical Association thought that they could develop a code of ethics that everybody would accept and that it would be widely used. It has been influential, but it has not been uh, as widely accepted, accepted as they wished. Uh, it, they used the form of Hippocrates, but they made it, of course, very secular to be more widely accepted. And it addressed mostly patient issues, not doctor issues. And it said, behave towards other physicians as you wish them to behave towards you. Or that should be patients. Call specialists in difficult cases. It warned against the profit motive and unauthorized advertising, which later got changed in the US. And healthcare plans, which were just developing at the time, that restrict a physician's independence, fee splitting, uh, and rebates, which is still a major controversy. They had unqualified confidentiality. They just said, keep this patient's secrets. Now, where they got into difficulty was over the long-held idea in codes of ethics about abortion and uh, euthanasia. And to be more widely accepted, they used some general terms about preservation of life but weren't very specific about, uh, about that. And that's one of the reasons that people had some difficulty with the code. Another interesting one was the caution against premature publication or declaration of treatments or discoveries, because we've had some difficulties with those. They did an important thing, though, by adding to the Nuremberg Code. What they did was develop the Helsinki uh, concept about medical research, and it is continually revised to keep up with the changes in research and the changes in concepts. And the last revision was in 2013. This was coupled at a time when, since the 1960s, the interest in medical ethics has um, advanced tremendously. When I went to medical school, there was no course in medical ethics. I don't even remember it being discussed. I did take a course in medical ethics because I went to St. Evex, which was a Catholic university, and they thought when Catholics are gonna go out into this wild world, they should at least take Catholic medical ethics with them. And so the pre-med course had a course in medical ethics, but the medical school didn't. But since then, major interest because of the changes that have occurred. The technology, 
the transplantation, all sorts of other things have risen uh, with the idea of challenges to ethical ideas that we never thought of before. And every year we get a new conundrum in ethics, in medicine, that we have to deal with. I was chairman at one time of the American College of Physicians, and I was interested that the American College of Physicians also had a code of ethics. They have an ethics book, and I, we, as chairman, we used to call on people to volunteer for various committees. The committee that most people wanted to be on was the ethics committee. And that's interesting because everybody had strong views. Everybody wanted to be on the ethics committee to determine how physicians should be uh, held into account. The uh, Russian one that I alluded to earlier was of interest because the, it wasn't the physicians who drafted, it was the government. And they initially said that the physicians should conduct themselves according to communist principles and order their responsibility to the Soviet government. Now, when the USSR fell, that got rewritten. And they now have one that's actually written uh, rather remarkably in favor of patient rights. There are many other codes that are continually not only written but um, updated. And we're seeing now not physician codes of ethics, but patients' bills of rights, the rights of patients in this situation. And they're very important. Now, repeatedly, we tend to look at what other medical schools are using as their oath, that when students graduate, what do they swear to? Uh, a survey of 141 Ameri North American, Canadian and US, 60 were using a variation on the Hippocratic Code, usually one written by themselves, but incorporating those ideas. 47 used the uh, World Medical Association code, and 14 used the prayer of Maimonides to capture the values that we want to see in future physicians. The American College of Physicians got a number of other major organizations and 27 European groups to agree to a charter on professionalism, which has incorporated within it a code of ethics for physicians. It, it'll be interesting to see how widely accepted uh, it, it will tend to be, but they made a great effort uh, to get one that would be used widely. Now we're now in an era, in the US, the physicians are struggling to maintain the patient-physician relationship in an era of corporate, consumer-driven, profit-oriented, computerized healthcare. And so a number of things begin to clash in that situation and struggling to have a code of ethics that will, will guide the physician through this is going to be very challenging. But in Canada, we're struggling to maintain the patient-physician relationship in an era of controlled resources in a universal healthcare system. And the question is, would a new code of ethics help us through that? Because a number of forces are now beginning to collide with different viewpoints and different ideas on what the value should be. So with your pen and pencil, what would you write in a code of ethics for your personal physician? And I think, as I said, many of you could probably do it. The kind of things that you would like to see that your physician would ascribe to. But you might find it difficult to get the person sitting next to you to agree exactly with what you put down. And that's always been the challenge, and that's why they continually change, and that as time goes on, we continue to revise them. But if you're gonna write your code of ethics for your physician, you're gonna to have to look at a list of these things and decide what you think the wording should be. It's often not so much just the idea, it's how you word it so that it would be accepted. And as many of those stories that occurred in the news this week, it wasn't that there was not a, an ethical code, 
it was not specific enough to address the complex nature of the problem. And that's what people writing codes of ethics struggle with. Now, will there ever be a code of ethics for physicians that all would accept? And my answer is probably not. And the reason is, we are of different backgrounds in history, different religions, different cultures, and we ascribe to different views on things. And so to write a code of ethics that everyone would accept would be a very challenging and I suspect uh, fruitless effort. But we must continue to try because as time goes on, things are becoming more difficult and we need, we need accepted uh, truths, we need accepted views on how physicians should act. It's very complex and changing and I expect that as time goes on, we will then have very complex and changing codes. Thank you very much.